we move ahead to Revelation 21.5 and continuing through verse 8, we see he that is seated upon the throne says, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, John speaking here, and then the Lord is speaking, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst, the fountain of the water of life freely. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But here we receive a warning amidst all of this joy, because again, love is always a double-edged sword. While we think of love and compassion as something that is warm and that is close and that is kind and that is forgiving, love also requires admonition, love requires instruction, love requires correction, and love requires warning. And here the Lord Jesus Christ gives one of his last warnings in all of Scripture. In verse 8, he proclaims, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And in chapter 20, we saw the result of those cast into the lake of fire, the partakers of the second death. Now, as we look at these verses, we see that the Lord, once again, upon his throne, as we've seen him here previously, proclaims, I make all things new. And we just looked at 2 Corinthians 5.17, so we know that all things are new in Christ, and old things are all passed away. We know that his words are faithful and true. We also know this from John 1.14, that he himself is faithful and true. We know that not only was his work done at the cross regarding becoming the propitiation for our sins, being the last, the final Passover, after which no more sacrifices for sins were necessary, and therefore he cried, it is done, but now all of the work is done. He is again proclaiming himself to be the one, the only, the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. We saw this twice in Revelation chapter 1. We see it again here in Revelation 21. He promises the water of life to all who thirst. He makes this promise in John 4.10 to the woman at the well. Furthermore, the Lord Jesus Christ promises his eternal inheritance to all overcomers. And we see reference to this in Matthew 5.5 5 and Matthew 19.29. Finally, he warns the ungodly of the second death. And again, in Matthew 25.41-46, through 46, and as we saw before in John 3.18, and again in John 3.36, Jesus speaks of the condemnation of those who refuse the only begotten Son of the Father. Now, in Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 through 21, we have a specific description of the city of the New Jerusalem. We have a description of the size, the shape, the coloration, a number of details associated with the city. And we're going to look at a few of these things, but we're not going to spend a great deal of time looking at this description in its entirety. Suffice it to say, a significant amount of time and effort has been spent by the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilling his promise out of John chapter 14 regarding this place that he has promised to prepare for those that love him. Now, to clear up a point before we move ahead, in verse 9, John records that one of the seven angels, which had one of the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, or judgments, approached him and spoke with him and said, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Now this angel does, in fact, show John the bride, the lamb's wife. 
but he doesn't do so until verse 24. In between, we have an entire view of the city of the New Jerusalem. Much like if we are to see the bride in a wedding, we don't see the bride presented immediately. When we enter into a church, the first thing that we see is the church itself. Then we come in and we're seated, and we see the bride's family, and we see the groom's family, and we see all of the ornate decorations and all of the preparations, and the people who are dressed, and everything that is prepared and decorated just so, and everything that is made ready for the wedding. And then the groom is presented, and then when everyone is ready, then the bride comes forth and is presented. And that is exactly the progression that happens in Revelation chapter 21, beginning in verse 9 and following. We have a complete description of the city of the New Jerusalem first. Then we learn of the Lamb as he is presented as the light of the city. And then we have the approach of the saints who go into and out of the city. So don't be confused by thinking that the city is the bride of Christ. Our Lord and Savior is not marrying a city. He is unified even now with every believer, every saint, Old and New Testament. And we have looked at that very carefully throughout our study of Revelation. And we have made numerous references to this in both the Old and the New Testament in order to give good documentation of what the Lord has prepared for us. Now again, it's not the city of the New Jerusalem that's the Lamb's wife, as some have supposed, for the betrothed of Christ is comprised of the faithful Hebrews of the Old Testament, including those non-nationals who by faith accepted the Lord prior to his incarnation, and the New Testament church, which has been grafted by Christ himself, according to Romans chapter 11 and verses 17 through 22. Through faith in Christ, both the Christ to come, per Hebrews chapter 11, and the risen Christ, per Hebrews chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, both Jewish and Gentile saints are unified in the promise as one bride of the Lamb both being his betrothed according to his promise, as we've seen in Hosea chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 19. 